good morning, church. It's good to see everyone today. Would you stand to your feet for the reading of God's word? Our text today is Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. I invite you to turn there with me. Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 20. Hear now the word of God. And passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in the boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. May God bless the reading of his word. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Father, we come to you this morning grateful, thankful for the opportunity to gather as your people, to freely do so, to hear from you. Lord, we come not to hear a man, not to hear individuals, but to hear from you. And so I pray that for your glory you would speak through your servant today. Arrest our attention with your word, dear Lord. We love you and we praise you, and it's in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, as some of you may know, um, my family and I took a little camping trip this last week uh, for a few days down in southern Indiana. We thought, you know, it might be a good idea to do kind of a practice run before the church camping trip in the fall. Wanted to make sure we had equipment and everything like that. And we really had a great time. We really did. We swam at the pool. We had bonfires, plenty of s'mores, all that good stuff. It did not rain on us. So we were okay in the tent. It was enjoyable. We had a good time. But one thing that we didn't get around to doing was fishing. We did not get around to that. Silas, I still owe you one. We will fish this summer. We just didn't have time to do it. We didn't have time to make it happen. And to be honest with you, church, the thought of getting everything ready and taking five kids, nine and under, out fishing just wasn't incredibly appealing to me at the time, if I can be honest here, if this is a safe place for me to, to be honest. I think, and I think that's because, to put it plainly, fishing is hard work. Fishing's hard work. If you've been, you know it can be a tough thing to do. You've got to make sure that you have your hooks and your weights and your bobbers all tucked away. You have to make sure that you've got some decent bait and you go at the right time of day in the right place, right? You gotta make sure that line doesn't get all tangled up and if, if it does, you burn half an hour getting your equipment together. Amen, somebody, all right? It's, it's hard work to go fishing. And then after all that, let's say you get it all just right, everything's in order, you still may not catch anything. You might spend the entire day just awaiting and, and, and nothing happens, right? It's, it's a difficult thing to go fishing, right? Um, but every so often, every so often when the stars align and everything does go well, and according to plan, fishing can actually be one of the most fun and exciting things to do, right? I remember growing up, fishing in the creek out back, and my brother and my cousins with the, the cut-up hot dogs in the Ziploc bag. Am I, am I talking to anybody today, right? <laughs> right? We'd, we'd catch all sorts of catfish and creek chub and all that. It was fun. We couldn't wait the anticipation, right? It was an awesome thing. So it can be hard work but it can also be very worth it, especially when you're successful, right? When you're successful in fishing, it changes everything. We're gonna see the beginning of a successful fishing trip 
today in our passage, but maybe not quite in the way you might expect. Okay, so I want to kind of give us the, the context of our passage here today in Mark chapter 1, right? We have been anticipating the public ministry of Jesus up to this point, right? We saw the forerunner, John the Baptist, coming before him, arriving on the scene, proclaiming the, the soon coming Messiah. We saw that. Then we saw Jesus himself arrive in verse 9 of chapter 1. We saw his baptism and the affirmation, the blessing upon him by God the Father from heaven. We saw the Holy Spirit fall upon him, officially anointing him as the long-awaited messianic king. And then we saw his identity as the true and better Adam, the true and better Israel, who went toe-to-toe with Satan in the wilderness, and he came back victorious, right? We've seen that, and now he's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And we saw that last week. All of this has been established and put in place by Mark up to this point. So the question is, what is this anointed king going to do first in his public ministry? What's he going to do first? Surely he'll start crushing Roman enemies, right? Right off the bat. Or, Or surely he'll start cranking out miracles or something. But actually... As we'll see today in our text, Jesus kicks off his public ministry by recruiting some teammates, some co-laborers, and to go fishing, of all things, right? Our passage today, again, is Mark 1, verses 16 through 20, where Mark introduces us to Jesus' first disciples, Jesus' first disciples. The outline for today, very simple, it's only five text, uh, five-verse passage. So we've got Mark 1, 16 through 18 is section 1. That's Simon and Andrew. And then verses 19 and 20 are section 2, James and John. That's how it's divided up here. And as we go, we'll see a consistent pattern. Here's the pattern. Keep an eye out for it. The pattern is that Jesus sees, okay? Jesus calls, and people obey. That's the pattern. Jesus sees, and then he calls, and then people obey. And we'll see this throughout the text. So let's look at verse 16. It says, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. All right, so Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee, which is really more of a lake, right? roughly 13 miles by seven to eight miles wide, this this body of water was a a key aspect of Galilean culture and livelihood in that region. The water is surrounded by mountains and hills, and it lies 700 feet below sea level, all of this making it a very fruitful region for wildlife and for fishing. It's said that the, the historian Josephus, as he thinks of the the Sea of Galilee, he extols the Sea of Galilee for its pure, sweet water and its many species of fish, its fertile soil, the pleasing climate that supplies fruit and produce 10 months out of the year, and the whole region is one in which nature had taken pride, according to Josephus. So this is the, this is the Sea of Galilee. It's a good place. You can still visit there today, the very top of Israel, just northeast of Nazareth. And this is where Jesus finds these two sets of brothers that we're going to meet today. So passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. He's walking along. He meets these brothers, and what are they doing? They're doing what they do. They're fishermen, right? And so we may be tempted to think about a guy standing there with a pole and a reel, one fish at a time, right? But that is not what we're dealing with in the first century, okay? These men were hardworking tradesmen, making their living by hauling in the most common food of that day, namely fish. And the Sea of Galilee, as we've heard, is the perfect place to do that, right? They would, they would use these large circular nets with heavy stones or metal pieces around the perimeter, and then they would, they would kind of sling it out in a parachute fashion to kind of open it up, right? And it, it would spread out about 20 feet or so. 
And then it would land and it would sink down to the bottom, capturing the school of fish, right? So again, we're not talking about one worm and one hook with one bobber, right? This is heavy duty, manual labor fishing, right? It was hard work. And so we have Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. They're hauling in the day's catch, which would have been a really decent living in those days, right? With, with fish as the main food of the Greco-Roman world in that day, the Sea of Galilee was a huge contributor to the broader Mediterranean market, right? If you had a gig there, you had worked hard to get it. You probably didn't want to give it up very quickly. So this kind of fishing was hard work, but it was worth it. These brothers made a good living doing what they do. They probably trained in these things as, as young boys. They grew up to be successful, hardworking businessmen. This is what we should picture with these brothers. And so Jesus saw them, and he doesn't simply pass by them. What does he do? He calls to them. Verse 17, Jesus calls to these brothers. Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Now, what is Jesus asking them to do here? Well, the phrase, follow me, is actually loaded with meaning, right? Because in one sense, Jesus is saying to them, follow me, walk with me, literally, follow me as I walk around and do things, right? Come with me. Scholars estimate that Jesus literally walked roughly 3,100 miles on foot throughout his life in ministry. 3,100, that's a lot of steps. It's a lot of steps, right? And, and he could have, he could have walked every one of those steps on his own, alone, away from sinners like, like Peter and Andrew, right? In isolation, he could have done that. But Jesus has a unique means through which he planned to advance his gospel. And that was by calling men to follow him, literally, throughout his public ministry. So in one sense, Jesus is telling these young men, right, hey, hey, stop what you're doing, leave everything, and walk behind me for a couple of years. That's what Jesus is saying when he says, follow me. Yet in another sense, this phrase, follow me, is another way of saying, learn from me. Learn from me. Be my student. Listen to my words. Imitate my actions. Watch me as your example. Follow me. Now, it wouldn't have been abnormal for a teacher to have disciples following him around in those days, right? This was a commonly understood method of educating the next generation. A disciple is a learner, right? And he would attach himself to certain rabbis, teachers, Right, for a time, to glean as much wisdom and knowledge as they could. I picture the, the little fish that attach themselves to the sharks and the whales. You know what I'm talking about? You see the documentaries, right? That, that's kind of what you have with the disciples and the rabbis. This was a common thing in the first century. Yet what was uncommon was for the teacher to hand select the students. That's different. That's different, and that's what we're seeing in our passage, as I said, disciples would request teaching from certain teachers. They would apply. They would request tutorship. They'd go out of their way to be discipled. And we can understand this in our modern day, right? Education, we apply for colleges, academic institutions. We request mentorship for higher education with professors and tutors. We get that. But this was not the case with Jesus, Mark very intentionally describes the opposite process taking place. Jesus, the teacher, sees these two young men. Remember our pattern. He sees them, and then he calls them. He seeks them out for discipleship. He's the initiator of the situation, and he calls them into training and service. So this was unique, and Mark's drawing it out for us here. So Jesus was summoning them to accept his authority and, in a sense, attach themselves to him, right? Follow me. The KJV is, is helpful here. It renders the verse, come ye after me, right? So these men aren't merely being called to follow 
some general movement or, or a specific body of teaching, Jesus is assigning them to himself to follow him. He is the object of the following, right? So again, this statement, follow me, is loaded with meaning, but Jesus, Jesus also gives them insight into what he wants to train them for, right? So in another sense, follow me is another way of saying, fish with me. Come fishing with me. I will make you become fishers of men. That's, wh that's why I'm calling you to myself. Now, what is Jesus talking about here, right? Is this just a play on words? He finds some fishermen. He says, I'll make you fishers of men. Is this just a clever phrase? Well, in one sense, it is ironic. It's not a coincidence that he calls fishermen. But I think there's more to it than that. Actually, I know there's more to it than that. Turn to the book of Jeremiah. Turn to Jeremiah 16. Okay, because this concept of being fishers of men is not unique to the Gospels. Jeremiah, the prophet, chapter 16. Jeremiah speaking to the people of Judah before their exile to Babylon, right? God spoke through the prophet. We turn to Jeremiah 16, starting in verse 14. The Lord says, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it shall no longer be said, as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them, for I will bring them back to their own land that I gave to their fathers. By the way, this is the, this is the idea of this new exodus we continue to talk about. We're not making things up when we see this. Here it is. Here it is. This is a new exodus. God will be known this way. In verse 16, Behold, I am sending for many fishers, declares the Lord, and they shall catch them. I'm sending for many fishers, declares the Lord, and they shall catch them, catch a people. And afterward, I will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them for, uh, from every mountain and every hill and out of the clefts of the rocks. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from me, nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. But first, verse 18 but first, I will doubly repay their iniquity and their sin, <clears throat> because they have polluted my land with the carcasses of their detestable idols and have filled my inheritance with their abominations. Okay, so what is God saying here? What is he prophesying through Jeremiah? He's saying there's a coming day when he will send fishers and hunters, he uses that imagery, to gather in the people of God who have been scattered abroad. But first, something has to happen. They must receive the due punishment for their sins against the Lord. We saw that in verse 18. In this case, he's referring to the exile, right? The removal from the promised land, which hadn't happened yet, according to Jeremiah, the removal from the promised land by the pagan nations, right? So, so it's after this punishment takes place in its proper length of time, then God will begin this fishing expedition, right, of regathering his people in. And, and that people will not only be comprised of Jews, by the way. Jeremiah goes on, verse 19. O oh Lord, my strength and my stronghold, my refuge in the day of trouble, to you shall the nations come, the nations come from the ends of the earth and say, our fathers have inherited nothing but lies. What a confession. <laughs> Here come the nations to the God of Israel saying, our fathers inherited nothing but lies. We, we give up, right? Worthless things in which there is no profit. Can man make for himself gods? Such are not gods. Therefore, verse 21, behold, 
I will make them know this once, uh, this once I will make them know my power and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. All right, so God is going to send out fishers to gather in not only Jews, but all nations. And, and they will recognize that the Lord is God. This is going to happen. And then what do we find in the prophet Isaiah? The prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 1. You don't have to turn there. You've heard it many times. Isaiah 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Okay, so Isaiah is saying that that, that double payment the Lord spoke of for her sins has been satisfied now. Jeremiah is speaking of it beforehand. Isaiah is speaking of it after it takes place. The exile has ended, in other words. And what's the next thing that we see in Isaiah? A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now we've heard that before. We know John the Baptist. We know the Elijah who was to come, right? So, so according to God's prophetic timeline, after the Jews do their time in exile, the new Elijah will, will cry out in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord. Then, prophetically speaking, the Lord will come to kick off this great cosmic worldwide Jew and Gentile fishing trip. Okay, that's, that's coming after that exile has ended of gathering God's people in. And so we, as we move back to the Gospel of Mark, we've seen the Elijah who was to come. We've seen the, the Messiah arrive. Now it's time for fishing, prophetically speaking, right? So, so when Jesus calls these men to, to become fishers of men, he has all of that prophetic weight behind his words. He's referencing the great end-time harvest of the world where the elect of God will be called in from north and south and east and west and will be once and for all secured and blessed in the presence of their God. This is a, a serious fishing expedition, you might say. And this is what Jesus is calling Simon Peter and Andrew to join him in when he says, follow me. So Jesus has seen these Brothers, and he's called them. Let's look at their response. Let's look at their response. Back in Mark 1, verse 18. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. So simple. So simple. Follow me. Okay. Mark uses his favorite word again, immediately. Right? He uses this word roughly nine times just within chapter 1. And he does so again here to show the immediacy of the disciples' obedience. Immediately, they left their nets and they followed him, responding to the Lord Jesus. Without batting an eye, they answered Jesus' authoritative call by very quickly saying, yes, sir, absolutely, sir, I'm there, sir, right? Now, the other gospels, they, they, they show us that the disciples already knew who Jesus was was to some extent. They've, they've watched him already up to this point. They've believed in him to some extent, but Mark doesn't give us that here. Mark just in, immediately says, he, he's showing us the authority, authority of Jesus' call when he makes this very clear. Jesus Christ has called them, and here they come, right? He is, after all, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. We saw that in verse 1. He is the long-awaited Messiah whom the forerunner John proclaimed. He is the one with whom the Father is well pleased. He is the new Adam and new Israel, resisting the temptation of the evil one and remaining faithful to the Father in the wilderness. Therefore, he is the king. He is the king. Mark wants you to know that Jesus is king. And he wants us to see that his word goes. It goes forth with power, with authority. And so we need to go ahead and prepare our minds and our hearts to hear this drumbeat, this bell being rung. The next handful of sermons, by the way, 
Mark wants to show us that he is the authoritative Christ. He is the authoritative Lord. And we see that in the instant obedience of the disciples. If we pause for just a second to think about some points of application along these lines, right? Kids and, and children in the room, let me, let me have your ear for a second, right? I think we can take a lesson from the disciples here. Your parents, kids, they are not God. They are not perfect. They are not without sin, right? And yet God has established them as your authority in your life and in your family. God has given you strong fathers and loving mothers to teach and instruct you, to lead you, and to guide you, right? And he has been gracious to do so. If you have that, you have a gift, amen? If you have that, you have a gift. And so the number one way, kids, that you can glorify God with your life right now is obeying the fifth commandment. Who remembers it? Who remembers it? Hand motions. Honor your father and your mother. Kids, give your parents a high five right now. Come on. Right? That is how you honor the Lord in your life right now. You honor your father and mother. You're obedient. You're respectful. You're submissive to them. Obeying quick, fast, and in a hurry with a good attitude, right? That's how we honor the Lord. This sort of instant obedience, like the disciples, recognizes God's good authority that he gives us, right? But that doesn't just go for the kids. Adults, let me have your ear, right? This goes for us as well, because we can't expect our kids to know how to do this if they've never seen it. If they've never seen it on display, right? If we never show them what it looks like to obey, to submit, to yield. So wives, do you respect and submit to your husbands? Do you respect and submit to your husbands, or is it more of an attitude of disrespect, disregard to what he might have to say, right? Your kids will pick up on that a mile away. They will. And husbands who are all about wives submitting, got something for you too, right? Do, do you exemplify that same respectful submission to your employers, right? To, to those who have authority over you, to the state, to the police officers in our community, right? Your families will follow your lead in how to submit. And not only that, but God has given us all spiritual authority in and through the local church. He has. That's why belonging to an actual physical local church is so important. It's so vital to the Christian walk, because many Christians today, and I know I've talked about this before, but many Christians today want to exist autonomously in the world, saying that they vaguely love the universal church, yet they want nothing to do with the actual expression of that entity in the local assembly, right? Because it's easy to submit to and honor and respect big name Christians on the internet. It's real easy. They don't know you. <laughs> they don't know you. They don't, they don't speak to you. They don't know your sin. Right? It's easy to submit to people and pastors online, but do you actually yield to the spiritual authority of your under-shepherds who are digging into the weeds of your life, who actually want to help you follow Christ right, with the authority of his word? That's what a pastor is. And, and I praise God, I know many of you do too, that we have actual pastors, shepherds, watching over our souls in this community, checking in with us, seeing how we are doing, how are our spouses and our, our kids doing, right? Caring for our souls. It's good for all of us to submit to the God-given authorities in our lives. That goes for kids and adults, right? And so we see a small glimpse of that. We see a glimpse of that here in our passage Today, the disciples do not hesitate to get right behind not just a spiritual authority, but the Lord himself, right, and, and follow him. They lay down their lives and their livelihoods, everything they've worked for. Think about that. Everything they've worked for, everything they've 
invested in, all their future plans for their careers, right? Their income, their provision for their families. Maybe they wanted to hand their business off to their sons, right? They lay all of that down in order to follow Christ. This is admirable, and it's something that we should all strive for. And so Jesus has seen these men, right? And he has called to them. He has initiated this call, and and we've seen their quick and obedient response. So that's part one. Let's look at section two of our passage. Look at verse 19. Verse 19. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in the boat mending the nets. Again, another reminder that fishing is hard. Sometimes you got to get out of, the, of the, the fishing mode and get in the boat and fix the equipment. Sometimes you got to do that, right? If you've ever had the line tangled up in your tackle box, you know what I mean. These guys are... They're dealing with an even more physically taxing labor with these giant nets. These ropes, they would get tangled, they'd get caught on the seaweed and the rocks and the debris. And what did you do? Well, you had to pull the net in, you had to stitch it up, you had to, you had to fix it so that the fish wouldn't escape through the holes, right? You want a, a tightly woven, interlaced netting so that your fish wouldn't escape. It's a waste of time if they do. So here here we have another set of brothers, this time James and John, later to be nicknamed the Sons of Thunder, doing some net repair inside the boat, right? And just just like before, Jesus sees them, we saw that in verse 19, Jesus sees them in their boat, and he calls to them. In verse 20, immediately he called them, And, and there's our word again, immediately, Mark's favorite word, Mark doesn't quote Jesus this time, but he just says that he called to them, and we have every reason to think this is the same call, right? The same call. Follow me, I'll make you become fishers of men. We assume that in the text, and this is their response. They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. It's a very similar story here, right? Except this time, they're not just leaving the nets to follow Jesus, like Peter and Andrew, Mark writes, this time they leave their dad. (laughs) They leave their father and the servants working with him, and they follow Jesus. As we might imagine, this, this, we picture this in our minds, right? Jesus is walking along. He's called Peter and Andrew. They come. He keeps walking. He sees James and John, and it says they're in the boat. Now, was the boat docked on the shore, and they're fixing their nets, or were they out in the water? In which case, they would need to dive into the water to swim to Jesus to follow him. Makes it a little more dramatic. I don't know. We don't know. It wouldn't be the first time, by the way, disciples swim after Jesus. Remember the end of John? Right? They're they're like a bunch of kids, cannonball into the water. They see Jesus on the shore. They're following him, right? But regardless, Mark's point that he's emphasizing is the immediate obedience yet again. Another pair of brothers immediately hearing Christ's call and obeying him, following him. Right? They have listened to the authoritative call of Christ, and they follow him. And that's it. Those are the two sections of our passage today, right? Simon and Andrew, James and John. Now, we've looked at some of the similarities, some of the differences in the two instances, but largely they're very, very similar, right? And so the question might be, why would Mark, who we've already gotten to know as a very brief, to-the-point author, why would he double down on this point, this story, these two stories that are very similar, right? Why would he do this? And I think it's because this concept of following Christ is absolutely fundamental to Mark's entire gospel, following Christ. It's it's what Mark is all about throughout his book. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, as written of in the prophet Isaiah. And, And the Christ has come to lead his people in a new exodus, 
as we've seen, not physically out from the domain of Pharaoh in Egypt, but spiritually out from under the kingdom of darkness and Satan. This is who Christ is, and this is what he came to do. And so following him is, in a sense, the core message of the gospel, following Christ. Following Christ along the way, and we'll see that theme, and that word, the way, we'll see that throughout the gospel. It's the core message Mark is explaining here, right? So he might give a little extra real estate in his narrative to tell this story twice, essentially, right? Very similar, these disciples follow the call of Christ. End of story. Now we need to notice, in both instances, Jesus... Jesus does not ask if these brothers would like to follow him. You notice that? He doesn't ask or or if they would enjoy following him, right? Or if they feel that something is missing in their life and maybe trying Jesus for 30 days might help them, right? Giving the Lord of glory a trial run to see how things go. No, none of these Approaches fit what the scripture gives us. Jesus calls the disciples and they come. Any questions? <laughs> that's, that's the thrust of the passage. They come. He says, follow me, come after me. He stakes claim on their lives. And with the sovereign authority of heaven and earth, he commands them to get behind him and begin walking. And he does so in love. He does so in love. He does so in grace to save their very souls, first of all. It's a beautiful picture of the authority of our Christ. He calls and they come. And sadly, in our day, so much of what we would call evangelism is very foreign to what we've seen in our passage today. An authoritative call of Christ to yield and to follow him and to bow to him, to serve him with your life, everything you have. Our culture looks at that kind of call and deems it hard. It's harsh. Why why you got to be so exclusive, right? It's, It's arrogant to think that there's only one way, right? They would call this unloving hate speech. And I think this is one of the great errors of our modern church. We have diminished the gospel to make it more palatable for sinners to embrace. We disarm it, we take the teeth out, right? We, we cheapen the gospel's power and we weaken Christ's authority in our evangelistic call. This way of thinking becomes evident in our culture's art, right? So for the fans of the chosen out there, plug your ears for a second. I'm not mad at you if you watch the show. I don't personally. Here's one of the reasons, just one of the reasons, okay? I think that they distorted the authority of Christ right off the bat, back in season one. If you've seen them, you may know what I'm alluding to, right? There's one, there's one particular scene, okay? The morning after Jesus met with Nicodemus. Remember that? Met with Nicodemus. Nicodemus is considering... Christ's invitation to follow him and be one of the 12. You remember this? Nicodemus thinks about it. He wrestles with the idea, and he hides around the corner from where Jesus is. And, and the rest of them are gathering. They're about to set off, but he eventually chickens out, and he goes home. Right? And, and meanwhile, the sovereign Lord of glory, the sovereign Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, is wondering and waiting if Nicodemus is going to show Remember that? He says, is, is, is anyone else coming? And you came so close. And I'm sorry, but these are the, the theatrics. And they, they pull at our heartstrings. They do. But they distort our view of Christ. They distort our view of Christ and his authority. The point is, according to the book, according to Mark's gospel at least, when Jesus is establishing the twelve, and issuing the authoritative call for them to follow, we don't see them think it over and say, let me get back to you on that. We don't see that. Jesus is calling these disciples to give their lives to heralding the gospel, the good news of the kingdom that he is establishing in the world. 
and they sign up without delay, right? They drop their stuff and they go. And, and as our brother so beautifully preached it last week, right, Brother Emmett, Jesus isn't asking us to come. He's not asking us to come. He is, he's telling us, he's commanding us to come and to follow him. Jesus saw, he called, and they instantly obeyed. As we think about this passage today, it's a short text. As we begin to kind of close and try to apply it to our lives, what do we do with a passage like this? Well, we all need to remember three very simple realities. Okay, we've seen it multiple times. That is that Jesus sees us. Okay, that's number one. Jesus sees us. Number two, Jesus calls us to follow him. Jesus calls us to follow him. And number three, we must obey because he is Lord. We must obey because he is Lord. Let me unpack these just for a minute. If you're here today and you have not yielded to Christ, if you have not submitted yourself to the, the following of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are officially running out of time to do that. Jesus sees you, friend. Jesus sees you. He knows your heart. He knows the thoughts of your mind when you're alone and you think no one is watching. He knows the sins that you entertain when you don't think anyone is watching. Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Jesus sees you. God knows your heart, and honestly, he knows you better than you know you. And that's a scary thought, if we're honest with ourselves. That's a scary thought. So Jesus sees you, and yet Jesus is also calling you. Jesus is calling you. He's calling you in this very moment to come and to follow him on this new exodus, to leave the kingdom of darkness and be transferred into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the beloved son. He's calling to you. It's for your own good that you yield to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so come, come and be forgiven, be transformed, be renewed, have your sins wiped away, be delivered from your sin and walk in righteousness, come to Christ and then yield to his word for the rest of your life. Read his law, love his law, love what he calls good, hate what he calls evil, submit yourself to the authoritative call of Christ. This calls for radical, immediate obedience. There's the third piece, right? He, he sees you, and he calls to you, and it calls for us a, a response to obey. If you have heard this sermon here today, you will be held accountable for what you do with it. You will be. Will you submit to the Lord of glory, or will you not? Will you yield to his authoritative call, or will you ignore his voice? Continuing to follow your own sinful heart wherever it happens to lead you. That's a dangerous game that you don't want to play. Don't assume that you have tomorrow to get right with God. Don't assume you can live a life full of sin and disobedience to the king and then at the last minute repent and believe and get in by the skin of your teeth. Don't play that game. That's not how this works. Just as Jesus said in Mark 1, Verse 15, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Amen. Do it today. And for those of us who have done that, for those of us who, who have repented and have believed and turned to Christ, we need to, to marvel at the fact that Jesus sees us as well. Amen. Jesus sees us. He saw us in our miserable, sinful state. Our hopeless state, plod, plodding toward the gates of hell, right, in all our own individual ways. And he loved us enough to come after us, to initiate. He loved us enough to come after us, and not in some weak, soft, 
maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Let me just try. That's not how he came to you. No, the creator and sustainer of the universe saw you and pursued you with the same might and power he used to establish heaven and earth. He called us by name to become his followers. Then he granted us the gift of repentance and faith to respond in obedience. You need him for all of it. Never forget what your God has done for you, saints. Never forget it. And even now he sees, he sees us as those whom he has redeemed, those whom he bled and died for by name. Jesus did not die for some faceless, nameless, generic mass of humanity that may or may not choose him, leaving the results up to chance. No, our salvation is as secure as the very triune Godhead himself. Our salvation is secure. As Shai Lin likes to put it, if I can quote a theologian, the Father elects them. The Son pays their debt and protects them. The Spirit is the one who resurrects them. The Father chooses them. The Son gets bruised for them. The Spirit renews them and produces fruit in them. So Christ didn't see and and call some vaguely identified mass of people. He died for specific individuals. Right? That's why we sing, my name is graven on his hand. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. He is your high priest by name. And if you have repented and believed, it's because he has granted you that gift. And he sovereignly planned to do so before the foundations of the world. Think about that. And so he sees our lives. He sees our going out and our coming in. He sees our labors for the kingdom. He sees our continued sin. He does. And he continuously pours out his mercy on us nonetheless. And so we too must daily decide to obey and follow Christ to listen to Jesus' authoritative call. We need to keep following him. We need to press on. So much of the New Testament is about pressing on, keeping after it, following him in his commands to assemble with the saints regularly. That's still in the book. We need to do that. We need to follow him and his commands to love our brothers and sisters and serve one another, living lives of generosity and hospitality. We need to keep after that. We need to follow Christ as he teaches us how to raise our families and how to instruct and educate our children. We need to follow him as he teaches us how to be disciples who make disciples. That's the other part of the program. (laughs) If you're a disciple... You're one who makes disciples. You're a fisher of men. And so we are called to imitate him and learn from him in this. And it's, it's going to look different for each of us. We're not all called the exact same way to the exact same expression of discipleship. Not all of us will be called, for example, to leave our father's business in the boat and follow Christ into vocational ministry, for example. Though that will be the story for some of us. And dad, you got to let him go. You got to let him go with joy because he's been called by the king. Not all of us will earn our living by proclaiming the gospel. No, but each and every one of us is called to follow Christ as his disciples nonetheless. We are each called to, to join him on this great worldwide fishing expedition to become fishers of men. Every last one of us is called to that. And it starts in our homes. We need to be in patient, steadfast pursuit of our own spouses each day, our own children. We need to be fishing for their hearts, for Christ. We need to be imitating Christ and following him as we we call them to follow him as well. But it extends beyond our households and our families, right, to our, to our friends and our neighbors and co-workers. Everyone that we interact with, we ought to view as a potential fish that we don't want to slip out of the net, right? 
May we be a community of believers here at NBC committed to casting the net of the gospel as far and as wide as we possibly can through evangelism and the proclamation of the word, right? But it doesn't just stop at evangelism. It doesn't just stop at evangelism, right? We then also need to continue in the long, slow, steady work of discipleship, helping people see what it looks like to follow Christ day after day. Because let's say your neighbor takes you up on the call. Let's say you invite them out to the, to the, uh, the event next week, right? The, the, what are we calling that event? Block party, the NBC block party. We're gonna have food and games and a gospel message. Let's say your neighbor comes to that and then wants to keep hanging out with you <laughs> and wants to come to church and wants to read the Bible. You're not only called to evangelize one time, you're called to disciple, to stay connected. And it's a long and it's a slow, steady work, but we're called to both. We don't want to, we never want to divorce evangelism and discipleship. We never want to do that. It's a false dichotomy. <laughs> don't do that as, as though it's only about a 30-second gospel pitch or it's only about discipleship and Bible study. It's both and. Believe the book. It's both and, Right? We see that in this passage today. Jesus' initial call is to follow him for the long haul. We see both. So, saints, we too need to hear and continue following our Lord. We need to be walking with Christ along the way of righteousness, learning from him, hearing his voice, right, individually and corporately. It's both and. We need to care about both as, as individual students of Christ, sitting at his feet daily, studying the word, as well as gathering with the saints to learn from him. So friends, Christians and non-Christians alike, the question is not, the question is not, does Christ see you? The question is not, does he see you? The question is not, has he called you? He most definitely has. The voice of the Lord rings through our ears through the gospel call. The question is, what will your response be? What will your response be? Will you imitate the disciples with quick, instant obedience? Obedience, the response in gratitude and submission to the Lord. Or will you rebel against him? Will you ignore his word? Saints, the sad reality is that many will reject our message. Many will blow us off and call us names and mock us as we continue to follow Christ and the historic faith of biblical Christianity. And we should expect this because after all, fishing is hard. Fishing is hard. It's difficult work. It's difficult labor. But the beauty is becoming fishers of men in Christ has a guaranteed success rate. You must not have heard me. It has a guaranteed success rate. When you fish for Christ, you will win. You will win. It may not always look that way. It may not always look the way we want it to look. But ultimately, you will succeed as you labor for the king of glory. His word will not return to him void. It will accomplish exactly what he wants it to accomplish. So let it loose. Cast the net of the gospel. Proclaim, herald the Lord Jesus and his kingdom. And as we do, we can take comfort in the fact that Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. They follow me and he, he will not lose one of them. He won't. So take courage, saints. Press on in your labors for the kingdom, believing that God will never come up empty handed. Let us respond to our Lord's call to follow him and become fishers of men. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, who are we that you are mindful of us? Who are we, lowly sinners, who live self-centered lives? Sinners who did not deserve your grace, didn't deserve a glance from you, and yet you saw us in our lowliest state. 
And not only did you see us and pass judgment on us, but those of us who belong to you, you have called. You have affectionately called. And you have given us the gift of repentance and faith to respond to that call. And my chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose and went forth and followed thee. Lord, you are so good to come fishing after us. And may we live lives of gratitude for your good and faithful work. Great is your faithfulness to pursue us. Help us to pursue those around us with that same urgency. You are indeed worthy, Lord Jesus. And we praise you for all that you have done for your people. We love you and we praise you. And it's in Christ's name. Amen.